Welcome back to lecture 10 of Zoo 3649 Evolutionary Genetics. I'm Professor Moodley and we are going to continue with our big piece on selection. Uh, we started with natural selection and now and we've gone through a lot of information about selection including fitness, how you measure fitness um, and all the evidence for natural selection from the from from the natural world okay all the e evidence we had last year, especially intriguing are the disease um, 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 examples for me um, and 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 they are beautiful il illustration of of natural selection in real time okay so diseases are also evolving and they evolve faster than we do because why their generation times are faster so Today's lecture is about artificial selection. And I wanted to talk specifically about artificial selection briefly in this lecture because artificial selection was actually used by Darwin in his book on natural selection, his original book, The Origin of Species. One chapter was actually dedicated to artificial selection. And what do we mean by artificial selection? Because with artificial selection, you can cre harness the power of natural selection, the power of evolution, and you can create what you want. Okay? And what we mean by artificial selection is what? We mean that it's the same as natural selection, except the environment, nature, does not do any selecting. Okay? We, we humans, we are doing the selection. That's why Darwin called it artificial selection, because it's not natural, it is done by humans. So, but it is still a selection. We are given choices and we select the best ones, not the fittest ones, the best ones according to what we want. So in a way, it comes back, we have taken the power of natural selection humans, and we turn it, remember I was saying to you, natural selection does not have a goal. There's no goal. It is blind. It just makes whatever it makes. We take that power as humans and we say, no, 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 no. We have a goal. I want to produce a cow that has big meat on it. I don't want to produce a cow which is skinny. Then I have to produce, grow 100 cows. I want a nice fat cow with a lot of muscles so that why? I can only grow 10 cows, it's enough. So how do I select for the cow with that? We can do it and we've been doing it for centuries as human beings, thousands of years actually. Okay, Humans have been taking the power of natural selection and using it in a goal-driven way. And when you use natural selection in a goal-driven way, the way we use it, you can get the, the phenotypes, you can get your outcome very very quickly usually natural selection takes a long time to evolve something right that's why the earth, the earth has to be old for natural selection to work but artificial selection artificial selection can happen very quickly because why we are doing the selecting and our goal is the fitness we want basically in our mind we say i want this and then we select to get achieved that goal that's why we can do it so much quicker than natural selection can do it. And as a proof that this is the same as natural selection, Darwin used artificial selection and all the, the breeds of animals that we have bred as a way of saying, look, we've been doing this for thousands of years. What I'm talking about natural selection is not new to humans. We've been doing it for thousands of years. Look, when we harness that power, how quickly we can arrive at so many different kinds of things so much variation okay so we can create distinct phenotypes of races of animals breeds of animals you know and in a short space of time okay so it is us we take the power of evolution because we are very clever we have got big brains we humans we take the power of evolution and this taking the power of evolution we were able to breed animals, goats, sheep, cattle, chickens, turkeys, you name it, 
everything we eat on a daily basis has come through artificial selection. What about plants? Wheat, rice, pap, everything. We made those things. They were grasses. Some clever guy thousands of years ago figured out, Aish, this grass, if I can breed this grass with that grass, what will the offspring look like? Oh, look, the offspring has a bigger seed. Let us just take that seed and grow only that seed with a big... And then what happens? You only grow the ones with the bigger seeds. Eventually, you get maize, millies, right? Because now the seeds are big and fat on the grass. That is how it works, okay? We can achieve this in a quick space of time. And it's thanks to using the power of evolution that we humans were able to go from hunter-gatherers, remember, before civilization, before there were uh, uh, domestic animals, domestic plants, what were we living on, humans? We had to go and dig in the dirt to find roots in the bush. We had to go into the bush with a spear and try to hunt a, a kudu or a, an animal and to eat the meat. You know, life was not easy back then. Suddenly, we use the power of natural selection in an artificial way we suddenly make our lives easy. We start growing these grasses with a big fat seed. One becomes wheat, one becomes maize, one becomes rice. They're all grass, different kinds of grass. But we carefully, we selected the best ones, take the best one, and thousands of years, look what we have got. Let's look at that. Let's look at domestication and how we have changed our world thanks to harnessing the power of evolution. And people are saying, ah, there's no evolution. Nonsense. Look and observe with your brains and your eyes. And everywhere you look, you will not be able to deny it because it is everywhere where you look. All our crops, whether it's millies, maize, sorghum, wheat, rice, quinoa, you name it, barley, rye, all of them, they were all grasses. All our animals, cows, sheep, goats, chickens, etc. were all wild animals. We were hunter-gatherers. We had to run hard after these things to catch them until we started domesticating them. Okay? So, domestication has allowed humans to develop from hunter-gatherer sticks and stones, chasing animals, digging in the bush, to becoming what? Advanced. Now we go grow crops. One field can feed a whole family, so the whole family doesn't need to go into the bush and dig. We just need to do one person to grow this field. That frees up the others to do other things, make new inventions. You see, without the domestication, there's no civilization. Right? So the very first, it's ironic that people don't get evolution. And yet, it is the very thing we use to get ourselves civilized in the first place. <laughs> That's the irony of the whole process. So let's look at different parts of the world during the Holocene, in the last 10,000 years. Different parts of the world. The Fertile Crescent is Middle East. What did humans there domesticate? See, all the cereal crops, okay? Wheat, rye, barley, oats, uh, rog, uh, uh, um, spelt, and all those kinds of wheat that we now make beer from. We make uh, liquor, whiskey. We make wheat. We make bread, right? Those things we can't do without. They all come from a family of grasses known as the cereal grasses, which were first domesticated thousands of years ago in the Middle East. That is the technology that allowed. And that technology, what? It went to the hunter-gatherers in Europe. Remember at the time when that was developed in the Middle East, Europe, they were white people, but they had sticks and stones. They had no civilizations. When this technology arrived in Europe, is when white people started becoming civilized. When they started having communities, when they started growing crops, 
because they they took this the the technology in those days that was technology they took that technology from the middle eastern people and that is why that is what has that fertile crescent and wheat is what has allowed western civilization to become the dominant civilization until now in human history okay because they domesticated those crops in fact the whites didn't do it it was the middle eastern guys that did it but they took that technology cows goats and sheep funny enough also come from the middle east okay so the wild ancestors of these some of them are extinct but some of them are still running around wild animals and you can see Aish, they must have caught those ones and they must have slowly domesticated them that's how they become now goats modern goats modern sheep modern cows okay so it's the fertile crescent it's all it's these um where's my mouse here it's these uh domestications that has that allowed the civilization of the western world okay it allowed the western world to leapfrog over most of the other civilizations that came at the same time or after it what about the domestications that happened in china the chinese were not sleeping while the middle eastern people were doing this in the fertile crescent domesticating all this stuff the chinese were not sleeping they made rice they domesticated rice it was also a grass like like wheat they it was also a grass but they made the grass the seed they selected that the seed gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger. eventually you got rice no pigs come from china rice comes from china and this these two domestications allowed the, the civilizations of the yangtze valley the yellow river valley ancient civilizations in china this here allowed the civilization of mesopotamia okay which then went fed into europe what about the americas south and north america yeah there were people living there they are the ones that domesticated maize corn millies what we eat as pup today doesn't come from africa just a newsflash ladies and gentlemen pup does not come from africa pup comes from america it was domesticated by the aztecs in, uh, uh, and the indigenous people of america and only when europeans arrived in america they saw the maize and they saw wow this is great and they took it to europe and they brought it to us here in africa that's how we have pup in africa pup doesn't come from africa okay so in america what was maize before it was it was a grass it was a kind of grass which was domesticated they domesticated turkeys they domesticated llamas and vicuñas uh, camelids okay what did we domesticate in africa we were also not sleeping during this time millet sorghum some of you know that this is the the the, the key ingredient to some local beers okay these things have been brewed for centuries millennia in africa okay and lastly i want to well actually it's not the last slide but it's it this is what your practical is about okay because we're talking about domestications of animals and plants and how this domestications of these things allowed man and woman human beings to go from a hunter-gatherer society to a civilized society like what we have now where we are growing crops we have cows we have goats you know it's not a struggle every day for existence to go to the bush and find some food we don't have to do this anymore because we are civilized right the whole world is civilized africa europe etc we are civilized we don't have to go and chase animals anymore for food right we have domesticated animals and we have domesticated crops from the natural world using the power of evolution but there was one domestication that preceded all the others in other words it happened before all the others all those domestications i showed you in the last slide they happened when in the last 10000 years in what was called the holocene ladies and gentlemen 
the earth has been changing for a long time okay 25,000 years ago we had what was called an ice age in this world okay the earth was dry and cold Africa was dry Venda these beautiful green mountains and green beautiful trees we have here they were dry okay what happened the ice since then around 13 12,000 years ago the ice age ended things became warm rain started falling properly yeah droughts were over and suddenly you find human beings in different parts of the world no china middle east africa the americas independently during the same time as soon as the earth became warmer we call this period the holocene they started domesticating things imagine human beings got the same idea at the same time in different parts of the world that's why in china they domesticated something in the middle east they domesticated something. in the americas in africa and so on but what was special about this time of the world why didn't it happen before it all happened at the same time around 10,000 years ago because that was when the ice age was finally over the earth became warmer and wetter and these and you could more easily experiment and grow and try these crazy things with with plants and animals okay it all happened in the last 10,000 before that we were all running around with sticks and stones trying to chase animal to find food to eat every day that was called hunter gathering since the last 10,000 years we have all almost every society in africa america you name it we've become civilized and becoming civilized means domesticating using evolutions natural selection but in an artificial way we take it and we control natural selection we make artificial selection and we create what we need to survive use the power of evolution to create what we need to become civilized that is a beautiful story our story is a beautiful story and if we say oh there's no evolution we are ignoring our own brilliance okay but one domestication story is more interesting than all of the others okay and that is a beautiful story ladies and gentlemen that is our story of how we domesticated the dog okay the dog was the very first animal we domesticated we have now genetics from skulls of ancient dogs which are 35,000 years old dogs are descended from the wolf we don't have well we do have wolves in Africa okay but our wolf is not the one that was used to, to create the, the dog okay the, it's, it's the northern hemisphere the Asian and European wolf that is the one that was domesticated to create the dog but the domestication was not 10,000 years ago like all the others when the ice age ended and the earth became warmer and wetter that's when we had all our domestications except for this one this one with the dog we had 35,000 years before so three times older more than three times older than any other domesticated plant or animal so our relationship the relationship between human being and the dog it's the oldest relationship we have with another species okay they truly are the best friends of us and they have been our friends for 35,000 years how did this happen the practical one that you are going to be watching on YouTube and you are going to be answering those questions in your practical guide that documentary tells the story 
of how man created men and women when i say men please i'm not being sexist now how we we humans how we created the dog from the wolf because from the wolf okay the common ancestor here are the lines of descent okay and where do all the lines come they come to one common ancestor and who is he he's the wolf the great wolf all dogs whether it is a pug or a chihuahua you know what is a chihuahua even smaller or a greyhound or a, a, a massive dog like a great dane or a saint bernard they are huge dogs man they are huge every dog whether it's a chihuahua a small one or a massive one they all come from the wolf and you know why we have the different kinds because some humans said i want to create a small dog i want to create a dog that can smell uh birds i want to create a dog that can survive in the cold places i want to create a dog that can uh, hunt without barking because if you bark you are going to scare away the animals so i'm going to breed i'm going to take the puppies only the ones who cannot bark and those are the ones i'm going to have puppies with and eventually all my puppies won't be able to bark why so that is why well, what we are we we have a goal we want a dog that cannot bark so we breed for that or we want a dog that is small we want a dog that is thin that can run very fast we want to chase certain animals we want a dog that is thin and long why do we have those sausage looking dogs why so we can send them into the hole and they can go and catch a snake or they can catch a, a something that lives in a hole a normal dog can't fit into a hole but we breed them long and small so they can run into the holes and catch what we want them to catch we created we used the wolf as a starting place and we created so many different kinds of wolves which we call dogs for every purpose that you can imagine we have a dog right they work they do so many different functions every one of these dogs breeds that you see and these are just a few there are hundreds of them right look at them they are so different to each other how can all of them come within a few hundred years because most of these breeds even though the dog has been with us for 35000 years most of the modern breeds are coming only in the last few hundred years so you see the power of evolution we were um domesticating dogs during the ice age okay so 35000 years ago it was still the ice age we made a partnership with those guys and that partnership what did it allow us to do it allowed us to catch other animals you can use him to hunt suddenly you don't have to chase the animal you can just send your dog it will catch it for you right and we were able to catch them we don't even have to kill them we could catch an, an a wild goat or a wild sheep because you know you can't catch it no, I can't catch it. We can't run and catch it. We are too slow. But when we became friends with the dog, suddenly those things were possible. We could catch them. Then what could we do? We could put a fence around and we could start domesticating them. Okay. So you see why our relationship with the dog lasted such a long time. And it's only because we had this relationship with the dog that we were able to do, to to domestic the dog helped us to become civilized that is why we call it man's best friend it allowed us to be to domesticate other animals to catch them and keep them and domesticate them and breed them how are we going to catch them by ourselves we had the help of them these dogs that is why we call them man's best friend and that's why the story is so beautiful okay so darwin devoted an entire chapter of the origin of species to artificial selection to clearly show the power of artificial selection and 
look at this slide. These are the different kinds of horses only where in the United States, in North America and Canada. Look how many kinds they've had just since the last 200 years. They've bred so many different kinds of horse. But that's only in one place. So it shows you how powerful natural selection is. And when you use that power of natural selection and you have a human orientated goal, you can achieve almost the sky is the limit. Who would have thought that domesticating plants and dogs and animals thousands of years ago could lead to us flying an aeroplane? Because that is what happened. Okay? You cannot invent something like an aeroplane when you are chasing your animal every day for food. No. You need to domesticate, become civilized, and then only you can think of fly, of making an aeroplane. So this domestication and the power of evolution has allowed us to become civilized as, as a species. Okay? I want you to take that, that idea home with you. Please start watching your practical one. Okay? See you in the next lecture.